Socks and underwear. Seriously? Blake, the doctor called today and said you only have to have eight booster shots. I got more presents than you. I got more presents than you. <laughs> Remember, Blake, before we open presents, we're going to your cousin's sweet and sassy party. So every day, something takes place that we take for granted. The sun rises, right? and the sun sets. And we, we usually don't think much about it because it has happened every day of your life. But what's interesting about it is I kind of feel like it has a good way of showing us our lives, the sunrise and the sunset, in that every day is a new beginning, which is incredible, and every day there is some darkness and there's also some light that seems like every day there are some highlights and every day there are some lowlights, some moments of darkness and some moments of joy. And if you can zoom out a little bit further and go, okay, in each week and each month and each year, there's also kind of that same movement, that there's a week or a month or a year's worth of highlights and lowlights, good experiences and not so good experiences. And if you could zoom out one step further. Our entire existence as humans, from the moment we're born to the moment we die, is like a sunrise and a sunset. That there are moments of greatness and glory and joy, and there are moments of darkness and pain and heartache. And when you're young, there seems to be no horizon to the possibilities that you could take on the world. So when you're 13 years old or 23 years old or 33 years old, it's like, unleash me to do whatever I want. I have so much possibility and hope for what could happen. And then you turn 43 and 53 and 63 and 73 and things change, don't they? Right? So now my, my body can't do certain things. Now my eyes don't see certain things. My ears can't hear certain things. My brain can't comprehend certain things. My bladder can't hold certain things. <laughs> it, it's sort of this trajectory of you, you start out bright and hopeful and you move towards darkness. In many ways, that's the trajectory of our lives. Things start out hopeful and move towards uh, less hope. Maybe not less hope, but less influence. So you start out with influence. You're young, you think you can change the world, you can influence change. Maybe you were the guy at high school who was a great athlete or a great musician. Maybe you were a lady who had great possibilities, great musical gifts. Maybe you were the rising star employee at your workplace where you could fix any problem, you could innovate, you could solve, you could build something. Whatever your mind set itself to do, you were able to accomplish but not so anymore. Like maybe you're at a point in your life where that's not true anymore. Where what you used to be able to do, you can't do any longer, and you find yourself trying desperately to maintain. Maybe it's as simple as you used to have influence in your home among your family, and now you don't. You used to have influence in your neighborhood or workplace, and you have less influence. I mean, people don't call you and ask for your advice anymore. Maybe you used to have influence uh, here even at church, and now you don't. And that change, that sort of orbit of I was important and I'm influential and I can make a difference starts to change. And it's amazing what we do as humans to try to hold on, to try to not lose our influence, to not lose our game, to not lose our looks, to not lose our job, what we do, what we find ourselves doing, some of the things we'll say, some of the ways we'll behave to try to hold on. And trying to hold on to influence is like trying to stop the sun from setting. How's it going for you? 
It doesn't go well at all. It's not possible. So what do you do? How do you handle that? What do you, we're all going to experience this. And some of you who are young right now are going, no, not me. Yeah, right. And some of you who are older are like, heck yeah, you're describing my day perfectly. It's going to happen to all of us. What do you do? So Jesus coming into the world, he comes in to calm every fear, every fear. Not some fears, not maybe, all fears. And even the fear we have of losing our influence, losing our voice, losing our abilities to do certain things, he comes in to conquer those fears because at the end of the day, the reason we act the way we do to try to hold on to influence, hold on to image, hold on to our body, hold on, is because we are afraid. What will happen when I lose influence? What will life be like? What will I do? Jesus enters to to make a difference in that sphere, to help you to realize you don't have to hold on to your influence, no matter how old you are. And in the narrative of Christ's birth, there is a story that I think helps us. If you dive into it a little bit, you start to see, wait, there are two different ways to deal with losing influence. And this passage in Matthew chapter 2 gives us insight in how we can handle losing influence. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 2 is where we find ourselves today. We were in Matthew chapter 1 last week, and we're looking at these narratives of the birth of Christ because in each of the narratives there is a level of fear. There's insecurity that people have, and the birth of Christ, literally the advent of Christ, He comes into this world as a baby. He's to push out fear, and he does it even in these stories. The tales, so to speak, that we have all read maybe since we were kids, but that are true and life-giving if we lean into them. So Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, follow along electronically or with your paper copy, says this. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, And I just want to pause there for a moment, because earlier in Matthew chapter 1, Matthew tells us the reason he's writing these words is to to tell us how Jesus, the Messiah, showed up to push out fear. And it's important to remember, this is is a story about how it all happened. And we're told in Matthew chapter 1 that he came through a virgin, that God was going to show his rescue to the human race in this miraculous virgin birth. And here we learn where and when Jesus was born, in Bethlehem. It's a real place, a real town. And when did it happen? In the time of King Herod, who was a real historic king on behalf of the Roman Empire who's overseeing Palestine. Matthew adds these details of how and when and where so that we would see this is not a fairy tale, but this is real history that can be trusted. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Now, we don't really talk about magi. Like, what's a magi? Like a Jedi of the birth story? What what are these guys? Who are they? What are they like? So, So history tells us that these were a group of people that came from probably what is now Iran, Persia area, and they come, and they're coming from a long distance away, which means they carry all their gear with them. They're on foot or on with camels, and they're carrying this entourage of stuff because they have to travel to Jerusalem. They need all this gear to make this. There's no like Motel 6 or Mwawa to stop and get food. They got to bring everything with us, and this, this magi shows up, this entourage show up in Jerusalem, And they're noticed because Jerusalem is not this giant city that you wouldn't notice. It's a city that people would recognize. There are people from out of town that have showed up in an entourage. Why are you here? Verse 2. They explain. They're looking for someone. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? They start with a question. They show up, start with a question. We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So they're on a pilgrimage. They're searching. They've left their day jobs. They've left their families. They've packed all their gear. They're showing up Jerusalem to look for someone. 
Likely what's happened is the Jewish people, when they were dispersed from Jerusalem over centuries, they left because of exile, and they told people wherever they went that God had promised a Messiah, a Savior, a superhero was going to come and rescue. Somehow the Magi heard about this. They're also smart dudes and dudettes. We don't know. They, they're, they're smart, and they know stars. And there's something in the connection about what's going on in the stars and something in the promise of the prophecy that a Jewish Messiah Messiah was going to come, that they go, okay, we're going to leave everything behind, pack up all our gear. We have got to go see what's taking place under the star. If this is the Jewish Messiah, we want to worship him. That's why they come. They have come, set aside their day jobs. These are not stupid people. They're wise They're learned, and they have come to worship Jesus. Look what happens next in verse 3. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. Now, why would a king be disturbed about an entourage showing up from another place looking for a baby? Why would they be bothered by it? He'd be bothered by that. Well, King Herod was known as Herod the Great, not because he was a great king, but because he was a great, evil king. Man, And he was known, history tells us, that whenever there was a threat to his power, to his influence, to his kingship, he would stop at nothing to annihilate, quell, shut down any threat. Even, history says, that he is known to kill his own family, his own sons, because he thought they were a threat to his throne. What kind of insecurity? How deep-seated is his insecurity that he would have to kill his own family to stop the threat that maybe, just maybe, someone would usurp his influence or his power. So Herod is greatly disturbed. He hears about this. He's greatly disturbed. And the people that are in his kingdom, they know how their king acts when he's in a bad mood. They know the kinds of things he does. So everyone in Jerusalem is disturbed. Verses 4 through 6, Herod does some fact-finding to see if this is true at all. The Magi say, hey, Messiah is going to be born. So so Herod brings all his smart, wise men in and says, okay, where could this be happening? And they're like, oh, Bethlehem, right here, right under your nose. That's what the prophecy says, that the Messiah is going to be born. So now he's more threatened. And in verse 7 through 8, he puts a plan together to ensure no one will threaten his power calls the Magi to him secretly, quietly. Hey, guys, come, I want to talk to you. He says, now, I want to know exactly where the star was, when it appeared, how it all went down. I also want to know, when you go and find out where he is exactly, please send word, because I want to bring my entourage there, and I want to join in the party for Jesus. I want to join in the celebration. It's all a sham, right? It's, It's all a plot for him to protect his influence. A king is born to replace fear with peace and joy, and you have two totally different responses. A wise, humble magi seeking to worship God. They set aside their lifestyle, their, their day, to come and travel and seek and find this Jewish king, and you have proud, sinful Herod seeking to do whatever it takes to make sure there's no sunset on his horizon. Hold on. Hold on. So Magi leave. They go find Jesus. The text tells us in verse 10, they're overjoyed when they find the child. Verse 11, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened up their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. So here are these guys traveling. They have this little moment with Herod. They go and they do what they came to do. They, they see this child, and something inside them is filling them with joy so much that they get on their knees and they start to praise this baby. I try to imagine that scene in my mind. What would it take for someone who's wise and humble to see and notice and realize that this is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and open up their loot and say, here are gifts. I mean, this is not a fairy tale. This is real. These are smart, humble, wise people that recognize someone is here who's bigger and better than me and eclipses all my hopes and dreams. I want to know him. And then 
there's Herod. And warned in a dream, these guys don't go back to Herod. They don't go back. They go a different route. And Joseph, as you read, the, the father of Jesus, is also then warned in a dream, hey, take the child and its mother, get out of Dodge, because Herod's going to have a temper tantrum. And Joseph takes his family and they leave. Verse 16, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. How insecure does a Roman king have to be? to go kill a bunch of toddlers. It's a small little town, so it's probably not a lot of toddlers, but every toddler precious to their mom and dad. And here's mighty king, who's so insecure about his influence and his throne that he has kids in diapers wiped out. What kind of insecurity, what kind of evil what kind of sin would grab a hold of someone's heart and make them so calloused to do that? And you look at this and you go, extreme example. That's craziness. That's insanity. You can see that. But I don't do that. And yet in this story, you see yourself in the mirror. Because I guarantee you there was a day that Herod would say, I wouldn't do that. And yet as humans, when we start to lose influence, when we start to lose power, when we start to lose control, we get so fearful, so insecure, that we find ourselves doing and saying things we would have said, I would never. And slowly, we make decisions to hold on and deny the fact that the sun of our lives might be setting. Season is changing. I can't control it. Most of us find ourselves maintaining influence by any means possible. And I see in this account two different ways. One way is the way of Herod, where he's guided by this thought, I will protect my self-interest and use shady, sinful tactics that lead to death. And you go, well, that's not me. And, and certainly in our modern world, this wouldn't happen. Really? The people in authority and power wouldn't use whatever shameful, shady, sinful tactics to quell any fear, any uprising, any way that their reputation or image is brushed under the rug. Whatever they have to do to make sure nobody would see their image changing, to hold on to influence. But that wouldn't happen in the church, right? How many sinful, shameful, shady things have happened under the name of Christianity, brushed under the rug to protect the image of the church or its leadership, just to maintain influence, power, authority? Well, that's not me. That wouldn't happen to me. For us, it's just most of the time so much more subtle. It starts by looking at a friend or a family member and being so jealous that maybe their sun is rising and yours is setting and you're angry. You're jealous because you look at someone else in your family or at home, at work, and you see their success, their accomplishments, their joy, you see their cash, you see their relationships, and you subtly, quietly hate them because you want to be in the spotlight. It's a lot more subtle. It's, you have a child, and when they're young, you can control everything, but she's not a baby girl anymore, and that's not your precious baby boy. They're adults now, and you can't control them. You can't change them, but you desperately try to manipulate, cajole, force yourself into their lives. Or maybe it's quiet and subtle, or maybe it's aggressive and loud, but you've got to maintain influence. Maybe somebody at work is smarter, they're faster, they're brighter, they're more creative. They're rising and you're setting, but you won't give up. You won't stop. 
You won't let them go. You have to do whatever it takes to maintain your spot, your paycheck, your power, your influence. Maybe it's seeing someone and realizing things are going well for them, and you make yourself feel better by slandering their reputation, by speaking about them in ways that are gossip, slander, trash-talking them behind their backs, because you wouldn't possibly want someone else to get the spotlight, someone else to be influential, someone else to be successful in your life. Oh, it's a lot more subtle than killing toddlers, but it's alive inside of all of us when we start to lose influence, the things we find ourselves doing, maybe it's just as simple as you really can't hear and you're always going, huh? Your body really can't do the things you used to do, but you're too tough to admit it. I could do it. Maybe you're at a season of your life where the sun is setting and it's okay. Because there are great consequences when you try to protect your self-interest. It always leads to death. Always leads to death. When I try to hold on to my influence, it leads to the death of my character, the death of my reputation, the death of my integrity. Because if I have to find whatever i got to do, shady or sinful, to maintain this position, maintain the influence, maintain the image, maintain, then I find myself doing things that put to death my character, death my integrity, death my reputation, and maybe not just mine, maybe it puts to death the the reputation of my king, because all my coworkers and my family know I'm a Christ follower. Wait, aren't you supposed to be that guy who believes in Jesus, and yet you're trying so hard to maintain influence, maintain body image, maintain status quo, that everything's good in your family? You got the nice car, the nice house, the nice image, everything's good, but what are you doing behind the scenes, shady, to make that happen? Oh, the death of your reputation and integrity and the reputation of our king when you choose to hold on to influence instead of saying, wait, no, that's not my job. And the death of relationships, how many hurts have been caused in families and in friendships because you were unwilling to let someone rise, let someone change, let someone succeed. Relationships killed. But there's another way to approach this. It's the way of the Magi. I will seek God's kingdom, not mine. I'll live a life of worship that leads to joy. I mean, that's their their pursuit. I'll, I'll set aside my life. I will find you, God. I will seek you, and I will lay my life down and my treasures down and my schedule down to honor you. See, what would it be like for us if we actually embrace the fact that we are born, we live, and we die? That we're not immortal? That there is a span of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years here that we live on earth? If we would embrace that sunrise to sunset and stop pretending like that's not going to happen because it will happen. And if we could live at whatever phase in that sunrise or sunset, realizing that the kingdom that we're advancing is not our kingdom, so even in my most successful, prominent, star-struck moments where I'm doing the most good and influential, that even that is God's kingdom, not mine. That's God's grace, not mine. And when I'm losing influence and maybe losing traction and losing a grip on life and and things aren't going so well, that God is in that as well, that his grace precedes my best efforts and my worst efforts, and he holds it all together, and it's his kingdom that will not end, not mine. It's his kingdom that will never fade. I will fade. I will grow old. I will die. But he is an eternal king that when his son rises from the dead, creates for us victorious living forever, that we don't have to hold on to this earth any longer. I don't have to hold on to my body image any longer, my reputation any longer. I don't have to worry about my future any longer. And instead of being manipulative, sinful, cajoling, slanderous, gossip, all of that jazz, I can follow you. 
And I can hitch my wagon to you. You are the rising superstar that will never fade. And I don't have to be. I can't be. You deserve all glory and honor, wisdom and power now and forevermore. I trust you. I trust you. Imagine if I could wake up each day thinking about the fact that there is a circuit of my life and wherever I am on that journey, God's with me. And I don't have to try to stop and be any different than what I am. I can be comfortable in my own skin, faithful to my God, knowing he is the everlasting kingdom and I am just a small part in advancing his purposes in the here and now. Your influence to advance God's kingdom is how you will replace fear with joy. You seeing yourself in his kingdom, serving his purposes, is how fear goes away and joy comes to light. Somehow these magi, I don't understand how, I really don't, I don't know how they saw this baby and understood the prophecy that out of you, Bethlehem, will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. I don't know how they saw it, but they saw it. And all those who seek, and all those who are wise, and all those who are humble see Jesus. And what's incredible about Jesus is he's not a dominating, domineering, manipulative leader. He's a shepherd. He's a gentle shepherd who knows his sheep, who provides for his sheep, who protects his sheep. And when you recognize him for who he is and choose on a daily, hour by hour basis to say, I'm not going to hold on to my kingdom, the kingdom of Joe Hensler. I'm going to follow your kingdom. That no matter where you are, maybe you're young and you're a teenager and you're just starting to rise and you think everything's great and you're looking at me going, oh, you're so lame, you're old, Joe, this is good for old people, but everything's great for me. Maybe you're in middle age. Maybe the sun is setting and you are close to darkness. Wherever you are on that journey, your shepherd is here. He is alive and loves you and wants to go with you through that journey and give you peace. Pray with me. I'm so grateful, God, that you understand that my life is a vapor here today and gone tomorrow. That no one, in the sound of my voice, knows the day or hour we will take our final breath, but we know we will. You hold all things together, and you have the keys to life and death. You, Jesus, came to be a shepherd, the shepherd of your people. But all those who are humble and wise enough to see their own sin, see their own lim limitations, and see your greatness and your power, all those who come to you, see you for who you are, you promise to be their shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Jesus makes me lie down in green pastures. Jesus leads me beside quiet waters. Jesus refreshes my soul. Jesus guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.